No, so it's uh, okay. I've got an epigraph, it's like a little quote at the beginning to uh, to haunt the text or to haunt what I'm going to say. It's there lurking underneath and causing trouble, and it's uh, it's from Nietzsche's uh, uh, posthumous notes, uh, the will to power number four seven seven. And it's just a little thing. Everything of which we become conscious is arranged, simplified, schematized, interpreted through and through. So I want that, that to sort of be subterranean throughout everything that I'm going to say now. So uh, I'll just read the first bit here because it's. I've, I don't think I can improvise it any better. Inevitably, various attempts have been made to provide frameworks for mapping, navigating and determining the meaning of psychedelic experiences. And I think we've kind of heard that um, um, in the first, the first talk. So I'm going to explore the possibility of using uh, a text called the Yoga Sutra written by a geezer called Patanjali for doing that very thing of mapping, navigating and determining the meaning of psychedelic experience. I'm not saying it's the only one that we can use. I'm saying we could probably concoct some new ones, but I am saying that it's, it's useful and for, for reasons which I think will become apparent. So... Uh, Let's see what I've got in here now. Now, I do, I do say, uh, in line with our first speaker, that nothing metaphysical is decided by psychedelic experience. It's not going to give you the truth, capital T, about reality, capital R. And, the, the, you know, this is, this, is, this is why we get so many interpretations of psychedelic experience, because it doesn't... It doesn't yield metaphysical truth, capital T. Maybe there is no metaphysical truth, capital T. Who knows? I, I don't, you know, and I, I don't think we're going to find it. Is my uh, bet, if I was a betting man, that's what I'd say. So no, nothing uh, metaphysical decided by um, psychedelic experience. Though it does, it does touch the conviction nerve. You know, you, could, you come away and you're pretty convinced that the, uh, the robots from the planet Zaga controlling everything, including the, uh, the, the IMF and blah, 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 you know, and the CIA and all the rest of it. But nevertheless, it, it, it is, I am saying that I want to come to the conclusion that psychedelic experience is very useful um, to us. It helps us to flourish, potentially, not necessarily, but potentially enables us to flourish, even though we have to work out what we mean by flourish, which I think is what you're getting at. Um, but it's useful especially when it's grounded, when it can actualise in, in uh, everyday life and um, have some kind of relevance to the day-to-day -day unfolding of our lives. So that's uh, where I'm going to go. So a few couple of preliminaries. All right, uh, I'll, just, I'll just mention, I'll, I'll use the term psychedelic rather than entheogen. I think um, entheogen is pretty popular now, but, it, you know, which you all know means um, invoking the presence of God. But it seems to me God, God might not turn up. Whereas psychedelic meaning mind manifesting, in other words, uh, uh, mind revealing, I think that there we have something that I'm interested in, you know, I would say... Um, and probably most of you in here are explorers, you people who are wanting to explore new, new, new territory. And uh, therefore you would be interested in uh, uh, discovering hidden contents of your mind or some uh, features of the mind in general, of the human mind in general. So a psychedelic mind manifesting, that's what I'm going to use. It suits my purposes. So. All right, so, yeah, preliminaries. Um, psych the, this term, psychedelic experience, I think that's a... To unpack that, one would probably have to unpack experience, and I'm not going to go there, because that's a rabbit hole, and we'll be down there for the next ten years. So, uh, I'm just going to take it... You all know what psychedelic experience is. That's it. I'm going to have to leave it at that, otherwise we're doomed, you know, to... 
um, philosophy, you know, death by philosophy. Okay. So um, the other actor in this story that I'm telling, this um, story of resonance, is uh, Patanjali, the author of the Sanskrit text, the Yoga Sutra. Patanjali's got a very high mythic profile, but we know nothing factual about who it was. We're, we're even dating this text fairly tricky. Uh, uh, the best scholarship, I would say, is looking at 200 BC to 200 AD, or what do we call it, it's at CE, and um, uh, before the Common Era and in the Common Era. So it's a little 400 year window. Uh, some people, like nationalists and yoga enthusiasts, like to kind of push it further back in time because the idea is that if it's old, it's good. So you hear 5,000 years, 10,000 years, you know, and it's like lots of hyperbole. But really, a couple of thousand years old, this text. Uh, it's short. There are uh, 197, no, 196 aphorisms. Very short, pithy statements. Some of them are only two words, three words. The whole thing you could probably get on a few sides of A4. Very, very short, very condensed. And it, it seems to me that it's meant to be fairly puzzling so that you'll chew on it. It has this classic aphoristic uh, use. Uh, the, it, it doesn't tell you anything, but it gives you something to chew on. And uh, hence the, n the number of commentaries. I would say that the Yoga Sutra is infinitely interpretable. As soon as the thing was written, somebody was interpreting it, writing a commentary which is about a million words. Um, in the light of uh, an ancient Indian uh, ontology called Samkhya, and then a bit later somebody interpreted in the light of Advaita. In modern times, um, it's been interpreted in the light of psychoanalysis, uh, the philosophy of Heidegger, British empiricism, Vivekananda, for instance, interpreted it in the light of um, British empiricism. Um, and the philosophy of Krishnamurti has also been br brought to bear on it and loads of other stuff. It's very interpretable. We're kind of, and if you look at the English translations on Google, the last time I looked, it was a few years ago, uh, 200 translations into English. It's probably double that now. So, And uh, psychedelic experiences, I would say, is interpretable in the same, the same way. If we look at how many, how many frameworks have been brought to bear on it, and um, the, the first speaker, uh, I think, mentioned that. Um, we've got the Tibetan Book of the Dead in 1964, in which there was a, a, an attempt. You know, Leary, Alpert and Metzner you, uh, thought they could map psychedelic experience onto the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And they even produced a record that you could play while you were having a trip to sort of make sure everything went, went, went fine with it. With it. Um, about the same period, Stan Groff did, did an entirely different framework um, based on psychoanalysis and the offshoot to psychoanalysis. Uh, I don't know what he's preaching to the choir here, but uh, like Jungian depth psychology and transpersonal psychology. So he'd got this whole kind of raft of um, psychoanalysis, Fr Freudian psychoanalysis, Jungian analysis, and then transpersonal, bolted together into a system which he thought he, he could situate and interpret and navigate uh, psychedelic experience with. Uh, I mean, the recent thing, of course, is what we call, you know, indigenous perspectives. We're getting that th these days being, being brought to bear on it. So, the Yoga Sutra is infinitely interpretable, and uh, psychedelic experience is infinitely interpretable. So, and I would say to you that um, that, uh, that yoga, the yoga that the Yoga Sutra points to, is also infinitely interpretable. Now, uh, the yoga, the yoga of the Yoga Sutra is it's a meditation yoga. It's raj yoga. There's not it's not about standing on your head or breathing funny. Um, the, and there are a number of approaches to, um, to yoga it, uh, outlined or point, it really potentially points them out to you. He says, have a look over here, have a look over there. This is what he does, he's a bit like, it's a Zen thing, he points rather than states really, it's a kind of, 
Um, so the thing is, it's a practice manual for yoga people. Now, I, I would say about the, the, um, the yoga that he's, he's talking about. I mean, I def it, 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 it talks about two things, really, there. He talks about things that we can do, which are called yoga. Yoga is practice. But he also talks about yoga as a being state. He uses the word synonymously with another term, samadhi. So there's this being state. And, well, what is this being state? And... Um, So um, I've got some kind of characterizations of it, which are uh, you know, a, little bit, a little bit poetic. And I'd say that the being state of yoga is radical openness to what is, whatever is. Yeah? That's the being state, radical openness to what is, whatever is, whatever that might be. The method, the method is letting be with bright awareness. The, the, this is really my, my kind of su summation of what Patanjali is up to. So the, 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 and the method, there are different variations on the method which we'll, we'll come to. But the results of those, uh, the, that being state, you know, letting, uh, you know, um, what, did I, what did I call it? Radical openness, it's infinitely interpre interpretable. Simply because it's radically open, it's infinitely interpretable. So I'm in this kind of situation here, making a fool of myself, of, um, you know, um, well, what am I up to here? I've got... Uh, uh, an infinitely interpretable type of experience, which probably pretty well everybody is familiar with in some way. And I'm trying to get some handle on it with an infinitely interpretable text, <laughs> which is about an infinitely interpretable um, being state and beatitude. I'll just be, uh, you know, use that word there, that this being state is one of beatitude. So, yeah, making a fool of myself with that. But I would say, um, well, the, par the paradoxical thing is, is this. Though the ineffable cannot be effed by definition, you can't eff the ineffable. It urges us powerfully to act as the medium of its expression. We are driven to rhapsodise and poeticise by it. And this is just a part of the human condition, is that the, the, there is the ineffable, that which cannot be spoken about. Yes, we are urged most powerfully, if ever we encounter that which cannot be spoken about, to, to, to blab our mouths off. Which is kind of precisely what, what I'm sort of doing here now, really. So, um, I don't know, it's part of the human condition, let's go for it. Yeah, we, we, we've got like, loads of art and poetry and so forth as, as a result of this. Paradoxic, this paradox, this conundrum. Oh, hellfire, I'm going to have to speed up here. Yeah. All right, so uh, what I've done is I've identified uh, three phenomena that uh, are very, very common in trip reports and have been very, very common in the, the, the if you look in the book, the, the Breaking Convention Guide, you'll see these themes are, are just popping up everywhere the ones that I'm going to just briefly um, outline. And uh, the, trip, the kind of trip reports I did look at, YouTube, I've got a few books, and, and um, were basically, mostly like mushroom trips of, of the kind of do-it-yourself kind, you know, of the, some, some guy, his, his mates show him where, where the mushrooms grow and he tries some of this, this kind of thing. And I think, we, you know, we, we hear this stuff about cultural appropriation, we should be aware that we have a 50-year-old indigenous culture of mushroom use in the United Kingdom. It's only 50 years old, but it is by now, it is a culture, these people, uh, the, the hippies know how to speak to other, each other about it. Yeah. So, um, the first one, ego loss, ego death, which we kind of hear, hear a lot about. Uh, Simon Powell, who uh, has been to this um, conference in past years, has written, written about UK mushroom use. Um, I've got a quote from him here somewhere. I should have written it down. Yeah, uh, here we are. Uh, Simon Powell. I felt an ecstatic sensation of wholeness as if I too were merging with the whole picture. 
felt himself to be merging into, well, he's a landscape guy, you know, he likes, he's out in nature, feels himself merging in nature. The loss of ego, ego death. Now, right at the beginning of this, <laughs> yeah, okay, so right at the beginning of the Yoga Sutra, uh, 1.2, uh, Patanjali uh, pretty well outlines how to encounter this, this ego death. And he says that yoga, and he means by that this being state of radical openness to what is, whatever is, is something that dawns upon us uh, when the whirlpools in the mind, this is literal, the whirlpools in the stuff of the mind lose their power over consciousness, they lose their momentum. So what are whirlpools in the mind? I preach it that whirlpools in the mind are repetitive patterns of mentation, feeling and behaviour. I mean addiction is the ultimate one here, but, but Vritti's with the world, vortex whirlpool, are also very useful to us because um, inference, being able to make logical inference is a Vritti, being able to use sense perception is a Vritti, being able to understand the, the testament of others is a Vritti, so it, they're kind of useful to us, but this yoga being state is somehow to the side of that. Yeah? So, and the promise here is that there is some kind of cogn cognitive force to this being state. It, it has a cognitive content. The word samadhi is also, uh, it, it, Sanskrit, it's funny, words have a lot of meanings. It also means a mathematical proof, as well as this ec ecstasy of um, ego death. It's, it is also, it's also, um, it's also a mathematical proof. I say samadhi is the proof of yoga. So there's a very strong sense in Patanjali of a cognitive content, which of course, in um, uh, psychedelic experience, we do feel as though we know something, even though whether we do or not, it's another matter, but there's a, a strong, uh, it, as I said, it hits the conviction nerve, yeah? So it's, and, I mean, Patanjali actually says it's knowledge bear, bearing. Um, and he does, this is interesting in the light of what our first speaker said. Um, he, he does arrange um, these ecstasies into a hierarchy, uh, which I'll speak about in a minute. You know, the, there's a taxonomy of samadhis, there's a taxonomy of ecstasies, which are kind of hierarchical. And that brings me to um, a second feature, which is the phenomenon of feeling that you are encountering uh, an, an alien intelligence or um, an entity, an intelligent entity that can teach you some stuff. And I've actually got a few, um, a few quotes about that. I mean, we've got Terence McKenna's Machine Elves, yeah? We've got Simon Powell reporting that the mushrooms allow one to listen to nature as if she were a powerful teacher. And we're hearing a lot about that in the light of the call to activism for, for the environment in, the, in the, these circles. There's a commentator on YouTube called Dakota. The channel is called Dakota of Earth. I just randomly found this. And this person reports encountering a masculine entity who offers to answer his most pressing existential questions. Who am I? And all that stuff. So again, the experience is one with a purported knowledge content. Now, there's a strong resonance with Patanjali's uh, notion, Ishvara Pranidhana. And that means, literally, that gets glossed as, um, if I were a gets glossed as surrender to God. Uh, I, think you, I think you mentioned the notion of surrender in these contexts. I, I, I like to sort of get in a bit more into detail. There's a lot of baggage with surrender to God. And I, I, I translate that as coming into alignment with the ruling intelligence of existence. Um, Ishvara means the ruler. And... Uh, Pranidhana means this alignment with. Um, now, what, what, he, what Patanjali tells us about Ishvara is Ishvara is the guru of ancient, even the ancient gurus. And it's internal. It comes from inside of you. This, this is recognised. Everything in yoga is about inside. There's no kind of heaven up there or anything. It's, everything's about inside. So this perhaps is some kind of archetype of an intelligent being. Um, in fact, the guru is so intelligent, even the guru of even the ancient gurus. And Patanjali says, Ishvara contains the seeds of omniscience. That means it potentially knows everything. So in a sense, you potentially know everything according to Patanjali. If you can tune yourself into, into this, uh, or if you can master this meditation of 
uh, sur surrender to or alignment, becoming aligned with the intelligence of things. So again, a cognitive content. And again, a, a, a profound resonance with something that people are happening upon in psychedelic experience. Um, the third one is about... Um, The fact that uh, a lot of people have, have psychedelic experiences feel as though their lives are changed. Yeah, they, it, it, and healing, life-changing healing. It's a common theme again. Uh, one, I've got a quote there from somebody I found on YouTube who says it changed my life. She, she kind of took one mushroom trip in Thailand. She says, it, it changed my life because of the download I received. You know, a knowledge content and a life-changing exper experience. Now, Patanjali talks about th th this as well. And it's, it, 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 uh, I don't think I've got time to go into this because this is quite technical. Um, but he, he says that there are, f four, there are five types of samadhi ecstasy, this, this beatitude. Um, and the, and the four, first four are associated with objects. They are like a kind of an instasis of, of the, the reflective mind is brought to bear on an object a flower, a cup, plastic cup, and the mind's reflective, it's still, it's quiet, and, and that, that way you gain knowledge of the object. Now, you, you can gain knowledge of this object but still be aware of its name and its form. So it's still resonating with uh, residue in, in the brain, uh, or residue in the, in the psyche. Um, and well, that's a gross object. You can also do it with subtle objects, like the play of energy in the, in the body. But in, in those four, there is still some t resonance with what's going on, what's going on in, inside. There's some kind of residue is still operating. There's a fifth type in which there is no seed, there's no residue. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's quite hard to, to, to gloss that, but I say it's, it's a kind of... It's emergence with the, the flow of life itself. So there's no subject and no object, but that's what that is. Now, it's the, 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 the part about all this technical stuff that's relevant is that Patanjali says that this fifth type of ecstasy is so, it's so intense that it burns up all the residues in your psyche. In other words, it's a trauma. I would, the way I've, tr I've tried to gloss this, it's actually a, tr it's a positive trauma that's so uh, intense that it... It negates, overrides all previous traumas. And so that there is a, there's a permanent transformation of the practitioner's being by this, um, uh, th this phenomenon. So, so there's a kind of a mapping out there of how, how a life can be changed and, and, and healed. And, uh, and I think, you get, again, you get that with these very intense psychedelic experiences. People come away changed. It's almost like the intensity of the, of the experience overrides all the kind of shit that's been laid, laid down, down there um, from childhood and, and onward, and maybe from birth onward. So, so those are the three. Um, ego loss. Um, encountering an entity and, and change, life change. And they're, they're all mapped out sort of quite, quite well in, in Patanjali. Now what I have to say about Patanjali's methods is that they're pretty, they're pretty subtle. And if, you, if you've actually had a strong psychedelic experience, they become a lot more accessible. I think for a lot of people, they're, they're not that accessible because we're, we're just too dense. They're too dense and they, they rely on very, they're, they're very subtle and gentle. There's no kind of hyperventilation or any, any of that kind of stuff. It's very, but if you've had a psychedelic experience, it suddenly it all makes sense. And I, I, of the, the accomplished yoga people I know of sort of my generation, and I've been at it over 50 years, uh, pretty well all came to it through, through acid and mushrooms. That's because what they wanted was an ongoing relationship with the ineffable, rather than a series of one, random one-night stands. This is, what, this is what happened to a lot of us. We took, took hundreds and hundreds of trips in, in the 60s, and they thought, well, actually I want to just be more, a bit more solid with this, more grounded, more in, in the world. And so I think there's a, uh, there's a use for, the, for these practices. I've got to get there quick. I've got one minute. I've missed a big chunk of something interesting out there. But, um, there is a use here in, in, in the preparation. If you're going to do this thing, and I'm not encouraging you to break the law, examine local law, you could get yourself into serious trouble practicing yoga 
in North Korea and parts of China. So check up on local law before you do stuff. That's me minding me back. Um, but preparation, you know, this, 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 this style of meditations, even though they're a bit nothing -y in the beginning, uh, are a very, very good preparation if you are thinking about dropping a trip, as, as they say, as, as we used to say in the old days. Um, similarly, integration, I, I call it digestion. These practices really enable you to, 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 do, to digest this stuff, you know. So, and I think it works both ways. Yoga people who are stuck, there might be a case for having a, a you know, in proper set and setting, having a, um, a, a well-considered psychedelic encounter with the ineffable uh, uh, in order to facilitate your yoga practice and vice versa. So, that's about it. <laughs> I think there's a